I guess it's uh, it's time to get started. Everybody, welcome. This is the Informix uh, Performance Tuning webcast, uh, brought to you by Advanced Data Tools and myself. I'm Mark Cagle. Uh, in case you missed the introductory slide, let me get rid of these things. Okay. Um, There, there are several important aspects to tuning a, a system that we're going to cover today. Okay. Um, the, they include the overall performance of the system. Um, how is everybody perceiving the system to be running? If everybody's happy with the right way it's running, maybe there's nothing wrong. Um, okay. Um, we're going to look. We'll look at the I/O performance. We want to look at performance of the individual table spaces, um, performance of memory, um, and uh, performance of the individual virtual processors and uh, uh, the different caches in the system. Uh, things that are also important that we're not going to take a look at today are the performance of the OS in general, the machine as a whole, um, performance of your applications, what's going on in them, um, query performance, how individual queries are performing, um, although some of what we'll do today will be finding queries that are less performant. Um, we'll look at uh, schema. We're not going to look at schema design, but that's another thing that you want to look at. Do we have enough indexes? Do we have the right indexes? Um, is, uh, you know, have tables been broken up correctly? Do we have... Uh, a normal form um, that's you, that's going to give us an, um, efficient queries. Uh, we don't you know, data distributions are also something to look at, and we'll we may step over that briefly, but we're not going to take a, a concerted look at that. And then the layout of the storage and configuration, what's under the hood, right? Um, we're not going to cover that, um, and you all know where I stand on on different RAID configurations. Okay, so let me put this in the background. Hi. Okay. Lester, am I coming over okay? Yeah, Art, you're coming in loud and clear. I, and I apologize if there's background noise. I'm trying to mute everybody as they uh, come on. Uh, awesome. your, your email's still showing up, so. But uh, you're loud that and clear, Art. Just that little pop up? Yes, it's gone now. Yeah, I can, let me close that. Okay. So we're going to look today, um, basically we're going to take a look at an, a live server and um, look at actually how it's performing and uh, go through the kind of steps that I go through when I hit a new system um, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Um, you know, some of it is general survey, some of it is will be uh, or things that I'll look at specifically when I know what a specific problem is. Um, but I think we're going to cover it pretty much everything. So most of you, I think the first thing that I do is I'll run an on step minus P, right, and take a look at the, the real core basics. Um, how is, and I want to tell you up front, this is a, this is a fairly well-tuned server, so we're not going to find too much out of sync. Um, but it is a fairly busy one, so... Uh, it's going to show us some things anyway. Um, anyway, so we can see that the, the read cache is above 98%. That's really nice. It happens on this server that the write cache is rather high um, at 93%. Um, for most OLTP, OLTP systems, anything over 75% is reasonable, uh, but you have to know your system. If this particular system were to drop down to around 75%, right cache, I would be considerably worried because it does tend to stay in the 90s um, for right caching. Um, we want to look at uh, um, do we have too many sequential scans, okay, and one of the calculations that I, I go through is to compare the number of sequential scans to the number of ISAM opens um, as a percentage, and that will tell me what percentage of the queries the server is running um, include a, sequ a sequential scan. Okay. Um, in 
in this case, we've got about a little, a little less than 5% of the queries um, because we have 5 million sequential scans. We have 111 million um, opens. So we have roughly 5%, which is not too bad uh, and is pretty standard for this server. Um, that's pretty st steady state. If that was to go up on this particular server, I would be worried um, that, that we have something unusual and perhaps a new application came in. <laughs> Another thing that we'll look that we you want to look at is uh, the number of lock weights versus the number of lock requests as a percentage, and obviously this is near as close to zero as, as we could get and actually have a number. Um, so that's not a concern here. I want to know is do we have very you know relatively few queries that are being locked out uh, and are at least having to wait for locks if not getting lockout errors. Um, um, other things that we'll look at from here are, are my basic metrics, which we're going to next. Um, there is a, a package on the, on the IIUG software repository site. It's called ratios.shr underscore AK, and that includes a script called new ratios, which on this system I think I named just ratios. Yep. Um, script called new ratios and a, an SQL script called ratios.sql which you can install in your SysMaster database um, that actually produces all the calculations. The new ratios.sh script just uh, puts up a pretty report for us, and this is what it looks like. Um, okay, the first section of the report here, you'll see on your report once for each page size that you have on your system. In this system, we only have 2K page um, buffers, um, so there's only one partial report for the buffer cache. And then at the bottom, you'll see a total report for the entire system as averages. Um, and that includes two, a uh, couple of ratios that we can't calculate on the, separately by page size, uh, including the lock weights ratio, sequential scans ratio, and the uh, read ahead utilization. Okay. So let's take a look at these as, uh, as we go down um, from top to bottom. The read ahead utilization is. Uh, Goes back. We go back to the onset minus p report. Um, it basically compares all these numbers at the bottom. Um, okay, the uh, data read ahead, index read ahead, and uh, index data read ahead compared to the number of read ahead pages that were actually used. Okay, um, and in the later versions of 11.7, there's there's one more um, read ahead parameter in there that this isn't showing. Um, and then shows that as a percentage. We want that percentage to be as close to 100% as possible. Um, anything under 99.5% makes me uncomfortable that we're doing too much read ahead, um, and it's something to take a look at. In this case, we're at 99.9, which is which is pretty good. Okay. Um, the next number is the buff weights ratio, which is an attempt to get an idea of how much contention there is in the buffer cache between multiple users. Um, for the buffers themselves, but also for the LRU queues. Um, and it turns out that um, it's the LRU queues that are the most common point of contention rather than the buffers themselves, uh, depending on your applications. Um, sometimes if, if the buff weights ratio is too high, um, the, it can mean you need more buffers, but most often it will mean that there's contention for the LRU queues and you need to increase the number of queues, uh, LRU queues uh, in your system or at least for that buffer cache, um, if you're looking at the individual caches. Um, in this case, we want the, the buff weights ratio to be somewhere below 7%, most, uh, ideally. Um, anywhere between 7 and 10%, your server is probably a little bit slow. Um, if it's above 10%, um, likely the phone's already ringing, telling you people are, are seeing slow performance, okay? or at least intermittent slow performance. Um, the next one is the buffer turnover rate, um, which is an attempt to determine how much thrashing is going on in your buffer cache. How frequently are we turning over the buffer cache each hour? Um, and we want that number to be less than 10, somewhere in the single digits. Uh, in this case, it's ideal less than one, one time an hour, um, which is great. Um, obviously, what's really happening is a smaller percentage of your buffer cache is turning over much more frequently um, than 10 times an hour. Um, but if, if that number is less than 10, chances are the buffer cache um, is sufficiently sized. If it's getting close to 10, if it's above 10, 
times per hour means you're turning over your cash right every every six minutes or less, um, which is probably too frequently. Um, and data is being pushed out of the cash but needs to be reloaded a few minutes later. Okay, and that's why the, the um, turnover rate is so high. Um, the other, the used buffer cache, if these, this number, the buffer cache, BTR and the used buffer BTR are not the same or nearly the same, chances are your buffer cache is too large. Um, and if you run it on spec capital P, which we'll look at later, you'll see that there are unused buffers in the cache. Okay. Um, and so you can safely reduce your buffer cache without hurting performance. Um, the BTR2 and BTR3 were attempts by me to figure out what's going on at certain sites. I have some user sites where uh, the BTR is very high, but everybody's happy with performance most of the time. So this was an attempt to figure out what was going on there. Um, what I have finally figured out is the BTR2, uh, at certain sites we have a high level of inserts versus reads, um, then that can inflate the, the BTR um, without without really causing, uh, revealing a problem uh, with your server. In that case, you'll see that the BTR2 is under, is under 10, where the BTR itself might be higher. Um, so I have a site where the BTR this morning was 38, um, and the BTR2 was 4.9. Um, and actually, the server, for the most part, is, very, is doing well, and nobody's complaining about performance. Um, and so um, we, we can use that number. Um, it uses a different formula than the BTR. Uh, the BTR is based on the onstat p output, compares page reads plus, page, plus buff writes uh, to the number of buffers, and then divides that ratio uh, by the number of fractional hours since the stats were zeroed or since the server was brought up if they haven't been zeroed. Um, whereas the BTR2 compares uh, page reads plus foreground writes, LRU writes, and chunk writes, the actual physical writes to disk. Um, to buffers and, and to hours, okay? Um, and that seems to give us a better number when there's a high amount of writing to the buffer cache of data that you're never going to use again. So new data is being added, it gets reported on in the next few minutes, and then we don't need it again until the monthly reports run, and that's what seems to inflate um, the BTR. Okay. Uh, the lock ratio is the one we looked at before. As I said, it's as close to zero as we're going to get. Uh, sequential scan rate, as I said, is a little below 5%. Okay, um, our stats were zeroed out on February 8th, so this has been running for over a month um, with these stats. Okay. Um, so these are average stats over time. We could zero them out and look at them later, um, but we find that they're pretty much stable um, at this level. I have other monitors going on that keep track of this hourly, um, and so we know what, what's going on here. Okay. Um, the next thing to look at is how busy this, how busy is this server and what are the users doing? So we can run an onstat minus U, okay? Um, and the first thing we're going to see is go all the way to the bottom. This isn't really less because it's an HP system. It doesn't have less, so I can't jump to the bottom. There we go. Um, so we have, a, right now we have 615 active sessions. Um, out of a maximum of 984 since the server was, was restarted. Um, so you can see we, we have between somewhere between 500 and 1,000 users typically on this system. So it's a fairly busy system. One of the things that we, we, we want to do sometimes is see which sessions are busy. And one of the easiest ways to do that um, is to just redirect the onstat minus U to a file. Okay. Um, wait a little while minute or two, maybe do a sleep and run it in the background, um, and then do it again to a second file um, and diff them and see what's changed. And we can see how much activity there is when something has changed. So, um, yeah, so we've got this session actually did one, one read and no writes, right? But this session's done six writes and no reads. The last two columns are reads and writes, okay? Um, this first column is also interesting to keep track of. This is the address of the session in memory, um, and it's also it's um, the key to the sysmaster RSTCB, sysrstcb table, um, and it's useful in a lot of places. So, for example, if you run a onstat minus k and look at locks, if you're trying to find out who owns a lock, 
the address that's there is this address also. So you can go from there, take that address, uh, grep it here, um, and find the session number in the third column, okay, and, and map it to a session. Um, all right. Uh, what else did I want to say about this? That's about it. Um, next, I almost always do. What happened? Lost my connection. Uh -oh. All right, let's reconnect. I'm going to close this window and open a new one. Let's see if this one's still active. Oh, this one froze up too. Lester, can you still hear me? Yeah, I hear you fine. Uh, everything's coming through from your site to, to here. Yeah, I think so the web is open. Okay. Just lost my putty connection. Yeah, the email is different. The cell phone number is right. Okay. Uh, looks like we lost. <laughs> looks like I lost that server is what I lost. Walker, can you go check check out uh, FRI, FRI for me and see what's going on? I think we lost our server. Okay. All right, that we were checking out. You guys can still hear me, so I didn't lose my internet connection. Uh, well, while you're waiting, Art, uh, somebody asked, uh, where can you find the latest scripts? And I was wondering uh, if you could show them on the IIUG website where this is. Sure. You can do that. So here's my appointment book. If you go to www.iug.org slash software, that's the IIUG software repository. Um, all of this stuff, including all of my other um, and lots of others are here. Um, let's go to the full page. Okay. Um, and there's a, there are different sub-indexes. If you only want to look at certain kinds of files, this is the master index. has all of all this, the files in it. Okay. Um, and you can skip down alphabetically. So the ratio script is here, is ratios.shr underscore ak, okay? And you can uh, download it or just look at the, the description of it that I gave when I loaded it up, okay? Um, other useful packages that I've uploaded are these utils2, um, which has most of my utilities, my uh, um, DB access replacement utility, my, my DB schema replacement utility, rather, my schema. Uh, my data copy utility, DB copy. There's a high speed data delete utility, DB delete, um, and a bunch of others. Um, also, do stats is in there, the latest version of do stats, uh, which is do stats underscore ng for next generation. Um, and uh, the original version is in there also for those of you who have Informix, still running Informix versions older than, than 11. Um, the Utils 4 package is an interesting one. It contains a whole bunch of uh, aux scripts that you can use to post-process the output from DB schema or my schema, either one, um, to create other scripts. Uh, some of the ones that are in there are useful enough, but it's also a great uh, template to use to write your own. Okay. So, for example, somebody posted a, a question on LinkedIn yesterday about uh, I've got a, a table in Informix, and I want to create a duplicate table that's exactly the same schema but a different name. How do I go about doing that? So you can't do a create table like other table in Informix the way you can, for example, in Oracle, um, at least not in 11. Um, and uh, 
So um, you can do that with an aux script pretty quickly. Any one of these can be quickly modified to do that. I actually posted a quick and dirty inline aux to do it, but it's not real intelligent. Um, let's see, Lester says first rehab is up. So let's see, let me try and connect again. Restart session. There it goes. It must have missed, they must have had a network problem at their end. All right, let me get back on here. There we go. Okay. So picking up where we left off, I hope that answers the question about where the software is. Fine. Um, picking up, so we ran an onstat minus M. Um, yeah, our server stayed up. And usually I just take a look at this and see if there's anything interesting. One of the things I look at here um, is I'll, I will then go and edit the, the log file. Um, you know, I've got a, you guys have, are managing one or two or three servers. Um, and if you're managing more, you're probably keeping your logs all in the same, you know, same path so they're easy to find. So for me, this is the quickest way for me to find the log files on, uh, you know, 30 or 40 different servers at different client sites. Um, which are all named differently at different paths. So um, I'll go in there and edit it and look at how often uh, the logical logs are, are rolling over so I can determine if we have enough logical log space. Um, one of the things I like to do is, is my rule of thumb for log space, people always ask me, is I want to have four days worth of log space so that if we server goes into a long weekend and right after you leave the office on Friday, um, the archives start failing um, so that you, you don't have to come back into the office over the long weekend and when you come back on Tuesday, you won't have run out of logs and things won't start rolling back. Um, so that's my rule of thumb for log, log sizing. Okay. Um, the next thing I want to look at is, is um, uh, when was the last time we ran on archive? So onstat minus G A R C for archive um, tells us this system was last archived on the 8th. Okay, at seven o'clock in the in the evening, uh, and that's we do that. This server gets log, gets archived once a week. Uh, the logical logs get backed up as they fill and are taken off site to a, another machine immediately. Um, okay. um, if you're running any kind of uh, secondary servers, you can check on them quickly with onstat uh, minus gdri or. Uh, um, and this does have a secondary server, and that will tell you what the log position is. And if we go on to the secondary server and run the same command, we should see that it's in roughly the same log position, give or take a few pages. Okay. Um, and know that it's keeping up, um, keeping up in sync with the, with the primary. Um, you can also do this similar for RSS servers. We don't have it on the RSS, uh, onset minus G, um, SDS. Um, and on that minus GCDR or DDR uh, to check on various features um, and statistics of the, your, your ER servers. Okay. Um, so the next important thing always that I go to at this point, once I understand what's going on, um, is to do an onstat minus capital P. Okay. Um, and I'm going to write the file to, uh, to disk okay. um, and take a look at it that way. So I mentioned before that um, you may, if you have too many serve, too many data uh, buffers, um, if the uh, BTR and use BTR are different numbers, you'll, it means you probably have too many buffers. Uh, for most versions of Informix, if for part num zero, the other column is non-trivial, then you, that's how many buffers you can get rid of for the most, but pretty much you can get rid of all those buffers. They're unused. Uh, the latest versions of Informix, when those buffers are truly unused, like when, right after system startup, uh, they won't show up here, but you'll notice that at the bottom uh, in the summary report that it's reporting you have fewer buffers than you actually do um, because they just haven't even been linked into the data structures yet or something like that. Um, and that's a recent change uh, in the later versions. All right. The other thing I look for here is the next thing I'm going to look for is I'll scroll down and look for uh, what part numbers are dominating the cache. Okay, so that will tell me which tables um, 
topic more time on. Okay, so I'm going to scroll down through here. For example, this part number 5243094 has 40,000 buffers with data versus, and no buffers with index, but that's pretty typical. Um, unless you have attached indexes, you're either going to see uh, index date, index pages or data pages, but not both. Um, but it says 40,000 buffers pages, which is pretty solid, um, and, and it's quite a bit. It's actually uh, the numbers at the end when we get to the bottom. Um, but that's a significant portion. That's one table I would want to look at, and what I want to do is take the part number from here and look it up in SysMaster and find out what table that is. You can look that up in SysMaster uh, in the SysTab names table, okay? And that will tell you what table or index, what partition uh, or fragment of a, of a table um, that is. Okay. Uh, and I'll scroll down and look for other instances. Uh, we've got 19,000 data pages in this, in, in this table, 13,000 index pages on this table uh, from that index. Um, here's an interesting one. We've got one that has 340,000 pages in the cache, um, all in one table. Um, I will tell you that that's a stable number. This cache is very stable. I looked at this yesterday um, and uh, uh, kind of went through this, the script that I wanted to, do, wanted to do today, and it was 340,200. So that's a fairly stable presence in the cache. As long as that's stable, we're happy. Uh, it's when it fluctuates up and down, which is the next thing we're going to look at. Um, that I get worried. We've got another part number here with 45,000 pages in the cache, okay, 56,000 pages in the cache, 48,000 pages. So those are the, the part numbers that are dominating your cache. Um, you want to look at that, and that's out of 900,000 pages, right? So that table out of 340,000 pages has um, something over 30, 35%, 33, 35% of the cache uh, contents are in that, being used by that one table. Um, what I was trying to say is you want to look at that cache dominance and knowing your applications and how your database works, does that make sense? Okay, is it sensible that that table is dominating the cache as heavily as it is, that it's taking up 10% or in this case 35% of the cache? Okay, um, and that's something you guys will know um, because you know your, your, you, you'll know your applications, you know how your database works. You know what it looked like last month when you looked at it, right? And as I said, I know what it looked like yesterday versus today, um, and that's no surprise, okay? Um, the other thing we look at here um, is the, the, the ratio of data to index pages. Um, you know, you want to see roughly about somewhere between 5 and 10% of, of your cache is taken up by index pages versus data pages, uh, and that's going to depend on the width of your indexes and your keys and how many indexes actively used indexes a table your tables have. Um, so again, it's going to be one of those things where you know what steady state is for your server um, versus some kind of ideal. Okay. Um, what you don't want to see is a dominance of, of index pages. You're seeing a dominance of index pages where two-thirds um, of, your, of your pages are index pages or even more something's not right. Okay. For example, way back when there was a, an old bug in the early versions of 731 uh, that would cause 90% of your cash to get eaten up by index pages, um, things like that you don't want to see. Um, now I said I wanted to save that last one to disk. Somebody's on here. Once that minus P. We're going to write this now to, to another file. We're going to diff the A file and the B file. Okay. And what I'm looking for here are serious changes in the contents of the cache. Okay, for example, we went the un, you know unidentified pages with, that aren't part of any table went down quite a bit. Okay, not interesting in, in itself, but that's what I'm looking for are changes like that. Um, okay, and again, this is very short notice; it's only been a couple of minutes, but this table went down 200 pages. Um, okay. Um,
this table went down. Again, this is not, it's not significant. We're talking about a difference in 90 pages, but you see the kinds of things I want to look for. And what you're going to, one of the things you want to not see is you don't want to see big changes um, quickly. So if I run this, let's say I do this comparison um, five minutes apart, okay, or even two minutes apart, and I see 30,000 pages being removed from this table and added to that table. Uh, that table, one, removed from one table's presence in the cache and added to another table's presence in the cache, then um, if I look at it five minutes later and suddenly the first table has gained back 25,000 of the 30,000 it lost, there's some thrashing going on. And maybe I need to add 25,000 or 30,000 pages to my cache uh, to make that happen, okay, to make that not no longer happen. Um, and that will have been, you'll see that indicated in your BTR or your BTR2. Um, Okay, that that's happening, this will tell you exactly the, the, the magnitude of the problem by looking at this and scanning through it okay, uh, and seeing where the, where the data is moving from one run to the next. Okay. Um, what else? Of course, you want to look at uh, on set minus F output and see how your, um, where your IOs are. Um, Okay, you want to make sure you have zero or, or a very small number, like one or two. Foreground writes, we don't want to ever see foreground writes. Foreground writes happen when the, your, your application needs um, to write to the buffer cache and all of the pages in the cache are dirty, uh, in which case it has to stop what it's doing and grab a, a buffer page itself and flush that page in the foreground, in its own foreground, and then go back to work. And it may have to do that multiple times, obviously, if the cache is that dirty. Um, LRU writes are what happen when the server is um, is doing other things and your LRU min max dirty kick in. So you have more than LRU max dirty pages um, in an LRU queue, that will kick off an LRU write. Okay? Um, and you'll see uh, a state of L here if that's happening currently and which LRU is being flushed. Okay? Um, and what data is being flushed from it. Um, right now everything is idle. This was, these were the last numbers of pages that were flushed by each of the 24 flushers that we have on this system. All the IOs are happening in chunk writes, which is what happens at checkpoint time um, or around checkpoint time. Okay. Um, the newer servers, 11.50, 11.70, um, with non-blocking checkpoints, um, we've started to shift more of the IOs over to chunk writes, which are more efficient for the system um, and have less of an impact on other applications running on the machine than LRU writes do. Um, but st still, on a high transaction system, you may want to have perhaps a third of your writes happening at LRU time. Um, on this server, there's not, not sufficient write activity to trigger that. Okay? Um, and that's fine because we, we, the transaction rate's not that high. Um, in the old servers, before, before non-blocking checkpoints, we wanted to see about two-thirds of our writes in LRU writes and about one-third of chunk write time. Um, and this is, of course, is the onstat minus R, capital R, which is the LRU status. Um, each LRU queue has a, a uh, free and a modified or a flushed and a modified queue. Um, that's what I keep in my mind for the S and the M's. Um, so each queue is actually two queues. We want to see that um, the percent in the dirty side is, is low. Obviously, we want to see that it's less than the LRU um, max dirty. Okay? Um, and this report will show a separate set of LRU queues for each of your buffer caches. Again, this system only has one only has 2K pages. Um, this is cleaning down from 20%, uh, stopping at 10%. So right now everything is clean. We've got 0.1% dirty in some of the LRU queues, 0.3 in one of them. Um, so that you can see there's very little activity uh, modifying data on this server. At least right now, we're, people are just coming back from lunch, actually. Uh, another thing I want to look at is how the IOVPs, the AIOVPs are performing. Uh, we can do that by looking at onstat minus GIOV. Okay. Um, 
what you want to see, and here are our AIOVPs from here down. Okay. Um, and what we want to see is that at least one of the AIO VPs has an IO per wake up value less than one, which means that at any time an IO was issued, there was at least one AIO VP that was not busy okay, at some time and was ready to perform that IO as soon as it was requested so that no IO request to cooked files had to wait. Okay. Um, in this case, on this system, actually the server uses raw files, but um, the client that doesn't want to tune um, HPUX's kernel I.O., so we run, we're running with AIO VPs with uh, KAIO turned off. Um, and performance is reasonable, so that's never been an issue for them. Um, so here we've got exactly what we'd like to see. We have AIO VPs with an I.O. for a wake up from, from 0.9 um, all the way up to 2 point something, 2.3. Okay. Um, but what we wanted, wanted to see is that at least one of them is less than one, and that's exactly what we've got. So we don't have too many. Um, if you find that you've got some AIO VPs with an IOs per wake up of 0, 0.0, you can probably get rid of those without affecting performance. Okay. Number of AIO VPs you want to have on the server is somewhere between, uh, if you're using kernel IO, um, is somewhere between two and six, uh, depending on how much cooked file um, operations you do. If your temp TV spaces are in cooked files, obviously you want more of them. Um, if you do, if it's a development server where you're doing a lot of um, set explains, which write to cooked files, um, or you're doing unloads from a production server, then you'll need more AIO VPs um, to not affect performance uh, of those operations. Okay. What I'll look at next is the IOF report which is the performance of the actual chunks. How are the chunks performing? How is the I.O. subsystem performing? Okay. Um, and this is the report that looks as it looks here. What I'll look at is, is um, servers that have significant counts for seeks, for reads, for writes, um, and on the read and write side, what's the average service time? We want to see an average service time that's less than 25 milliseconds, so less than 0 0.025. Um, that's a number I learned from some system administrators many years ago, and, and um, I've found that it pretty much holds for me. Excuse me. When the service time is less than 25 milliseconds, for the most part, the server is happy and the users are happy. When it creeps up beyond that, um, then we often have I.O. problems and people are starting to complain about the, serv about the servers being unresponsive uh, and data not coming back quickly, even though everything else may look fine. Okay. And again, this is going to be mitigated by how efficient your cache is. If you have a server where 100% of your data is in cache, your entire um, um, working set of data is in your cache, um, as it is on this server, 98% of our reads and 93% of our writes are going to cache, um, then we can live with slightly less, slightly lower I.O. performance. But there will come batch jobs and things like that that do more I.O. and will require um, better performance. Um, you also want to look at um, how is my, you know, how are my logs doing, especially because those are critical. Um, what's the performance for the physical log DB space for the logical log DB space? Okay, here um, are they good? And actually, they're really good. Okay, because we do a lot of sequential writes on the log DBS and physical log DBS, um, so the, the performance on those are pretty good. You're going to see a, a, a preponderance of writes to those kinds of DB spaces, whereas your data DB spaces, you'll see a preponderance of reads, okay, and especially your, your index DB spaces. Okay. Um, and I want to, you know, you can look at the same information, but without um, that minus capital D will give you some of the same information, at least tell you the volume of writes, so you can quickly see which DB spaces and which chunks you want to concentrate on um, and which ones are the real issues. Okay, So we can see here on this server that we're doing quite a bit of, of writes to the temp space, um, to that temp space anyway, not to this one. So it quickly tells you where your hotspots are, um, which which disks. Um, okay, If you're 
um, chunks represent individual discs or, in, or lungs on different structures, um, it will tell you where your hot spots are and where you may have to um, move to higher performance drives okay, if you're having performance problems. Um, beyond that lower D, of course, will tell you all about your, um, your chunks and where, what their statuses are um, and uh, whether they're online or offline, et cetera. We're not going to spend too much time on that report. Um, Onset minus G cache looks at some of the some of the smaller caches, uh, the data compression cache, uh, the network caches for uh, usernames, for user IDs, uh, for groups, okay, um, and hosts. This is that uh, the, the new network caching uh, in 11.7. Okay, all those caches are, are displayed here. You can see what your hit percentages are uh, and see how efficient those are, those are for you. Okay. If your hit percentages are low, for example, um, our service name hit is low, but then on the other hand, we've only gotten eight requests, right, or 14 requests, eight hits and six misses, so it's not a big deal. Um, the other caches that are interesting, onstat minus G uh, DIC is the data dictionary cache. What we're looking at here is the size of the cache, which is 310 entries, okay, versus the number of elements that are actually in the cache. Now notice, let's go back up to the top, right? This column tells you whether those entries are dirty. If the entries are dirty, they're not, they're, they're not actually taking up space in the cache. They're, they're waiting to be reloaded um, if they're accessed. If they're accessed later, they may push something else out of the cache. So what we may see here is that we actually have more than, yeah, we have 340 entries in the cache because quite a few of them are dirty. There have been changes to the status of the table causing the cache to get um, marked dirty and set for reload. Um, on this server, the number of actual clean entries in the dictionary cache is around uh, 290, so we've left it at default, which is uh, um, 31 buckets and 10 slots in each. Um, but you, if you get that, if your number here is much larger, if you're running something like SAP or PeopleSoft uh, or uh, Genzibar that have large numbers of tables, then you're going to want to increase the size of your dictionary cache. Sorry, your dictionary cache and also your data distribution cache, right, which is shown by the onstat minus G DSC command. Okay. And again, the main thing here is to look at how um, how it's sized, 31 times 127, so we have roughly 3,000, 3,200 entries um, available, and we've only got 81 active, um, 81 active data distributions in the cache, so we're fine, and that's the default setting um, for most of the servers. Okay. Um, you can also have, there's also um, Onstat GPSC or PRC, I always do that, RC, which is the stored procedure cache. Um, if you use large numbers of stored procedures, you may want to adjust the default. The default is 31 and 127, again, about 3,200 entries. Okay. This server does not use a large number of stored procedures, so it's not an issue here. Um, okay. um, also, the sizing of the data dictionary of the stored procedure cache affects some of the other minor caches. Um, the same um, on config parameters, uh, PC underscore parameters that size the, the, the stored procedure cache also size some of the, the other minor caches. So we have to keep that in mind as well. Um, so now that we've looked at how thing, the server is doing physically, I want to know how it's doing um, and how how the individual processes and how how the um, the virtual processors are doing it, handling the load. Um, so to do that, we can look at onstat minus G R E A, the ready queue. And what I'll often do is do an R1, repeat every second, okay? And I'll watch that. Let's do two seconds just because it's easier to see what's going on. Um, and see, and what I'm looking for here is that the ready queue is either always empty or if there's stuff in it, that it's only a small number of entries and that I'm not seeing the same session, the same thread ID over and over and over again. 
Okay. Um, if I'm seeing the same thread ID staying in the ready queue for more than one or two seconds, then we've got a responsiveness problem. Okay, and you're going to see certain users, not all users, but some users complaining that they hit return and nothing comes back, right? Or they get the first page of data and then they have to wait for more data. Um, say, oh, we actually caught something in our queue. Okay, but you see, it, it, this thread came in, it was processed right away, and it's gone from the ready queue after that. Um, if you want to see what threads are actually active, okay, we can do onstat GACT, which is the active threads. Let's see more of those. Oh, Art, I just yeah. lost the screen. You lost the screen? Yeah. Uh, All right. You're still talking, but uh, your WebEx connection uh, disappeared. Uh, it, I'm active. On this um, side, it's showing active. Oh, no, no, it's it's binding up. So you, you uh, may want to get back into WebEx. All right, let me let me uh, try and clear this up. Yeah, everybody apologize for the delay here. Uh, we'll uh, get Art back uh, online and sharing his screen in just a minute. Yeah, I'm still showing that I'm shared. That's weird. All right, and I can't I can't get control of WebEx to shut it down. You may want to just close your browser. Yeah. Well, let me just, let's see, let me see if I can kill the WebEx session this way from the task manager. Okay, that's, let me try and share again. Uh, I don't see you on yet, Art, to uh, share. Go ahead. I can't make you the presenter. I don't see you logged into WebEx. You don't see me logged in? See, and I see me logged in. All right, let me close this session and go back in from scratch. I finally got control of it. And don't lose your voice session because that is working. Well, I may lose it off to get it back. Meanwhile, while we're waiting, folks, if uh, you have questions, uh, please use the chat facility to type in your questions, and I'll relay them to Art as soon as he comes uh, back online. We're planning to save about 10 minutes for questions at the end. So um, as soon as he get back, gets back on, um, we'll uh, take your questions. Uh, on the WebEx, you should have a chat button and just you can send it to Art or to Lester or uh, to uh, everyone and, and we'll see them. I see Art's logged in and uh, we just need to get uh, the voice back.
somebody asked the question is, will the presentation be available for download? Uh, the answer is yes, we are recording it. And uh, it won't be for download, but we will have it uh, available uh, on our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, if you go out to YouTube Advanced and do a search for Advanced Data Tools, uh, you should find uh, some of our past WebExes out there, too. I'm back. OK, Art, I'm going to make you presenter again. All right. OK. All right, am I back? Yes. I see your screen again. Great. Sorry, guys. Um, so what was I talking about? Oh, so we're looking at the onset minus G, A, C, T, which are active threads. OK. Um, right now, it seems to be quiet over there, and then nobody's doing anything actively. So all we're seeing are the poll threads, shared memory and TCP poll threads. Um, but ordinarily, we'd see user threads coming and going. Okay. Um, and we want to make sure that, that there's plenty of users go, things going on, um, and user threads that are staying in active state for a long time may be candidates to take a look at what kinds of queries they're running. Um, are they running long-running queries or doing large numbers of sequential scans? Okay. Um, there's also an, a fairly new and command on step minus GVP cache, um, which lets you look at the virtual processor cache, okay, um, the memory cache and the virtual processors, um, which is a tunable. All right. um, and it tells you by virtual processor, where's my cursor there? I am. By virtual processor, how efficient the, the cache is. I've got this system sized um, with the VP memory cache set to 4K per block. Um, and basically, the server takes the number of blocks of, of virtual memory available and assigns a certain number of those 4K blocks um, to each virtual processor. Okay. So at assigned 2,500, um, this virtual processor has given some of them back. It didn't need them, um, or they were needed by another VP temporarily, and so they were given back. Um, and that's just keeping an eye on how efficient this is. We want to make sure that our hit percentage, um, okay, and the free cache is uh, free cache is fairly high, and the hit percentage is fairly high. Okay, if these are low, we may want to add more memory to the server and add a larger cache uh, to the virtual processors. Okay. Um, um, the on minus G STM um, will show you all the S all the active SQLs on your server right now. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole list um, because I right now I know the top is all uh, system queries, so I'm not going to be displaying any real data, um, but I don't want to go down to where there might be uh, usernames or um, customer numbers or things like that. Okay. So uh, one of the things we want to look at here is on the per session on the heap size, how much memory was this query taking up? Okay. And that varies widely. Um, for example, from 14,000, okay, from 14K for this process to 87K. Um, for this SPL statement, okay. Um, so you want to keep an 175,000 for this select, okay. Um, and this is actually a select um, from uh, either DB Schema or or my schema, looking through the, the database catalog to find out what's going on. Um, or it could be a, a could be a do stats run, given the time of day. Anyway. So you want to see here which, which processes are using large amounts of memory, because those are ones that you want to take a look at the application itself um, that's running, that's in that session. Um, how do I find that out? Um, okay, is our um, session ID is here at the beginning of the section. Right, so this session ID, 328171, has recent as active, these all these queries active. Okay. Um, and we know that this one's taking up quite a bit of memory. And I know that there's just a lot of tables that it's going through. Um, we want to look at um, are any sessions waiting for things? Okay. So 
So this is not weight statistics, which you have to turn on um, with the weight stat, with the W stat on config parameter, um, which should be off. You should keep that set to zero most of the time. Um, those weight stats, those W stats are expensive. Same thing for the um, um, I'm sorry, my mind is going blank, um, is for one of the other stats uh, that's in there. Um, but your um, uh, I.O. stats you want to turn on, okay, the partition stats. I'm going to look at that in a second. So we want to see here, um, these first entries are all um, system threads, okay, the I.O. VPs, the other um, I.O. VPs for the logical log and physical log, uh, the miscellaneous VP, okay. But as we go down, we're going to find our listener threads, the server's main loop thread, um, okay. And then we're going to get into processes um, where we actually have user processes that have an, R, uh, an address. This is the same address you'll find on onstat minus U, okay. Um, and the first column is the thread ID, which isn't particularly useful, but from the RSTCB number, which is the address from onstat U, we can track this to a session ID. Okay. Um, so if we find a session that's doing a lot of waiting. All these SQL exec threads, those are the main processor threads for a user session. Okay. Um, the flush threads that I was looking at before are actually uh, page cleaners. Okay. The DB worker threads and the DB scheduler thread um, are the task manager threads. Um, here should be tree cleaner thread. I only have one configured here. So we can see what's going on here. Uh, these are the data replication threads that are keeping track of the secondary server. And we just want to see what's, what, what the wait states are. Net norm is what we want to see. This, is, this thread is sitting here waiting for the user to type something and send a command. SM read is, is uh, and these are uh, network connections. SM read wait is also a wait state, waiting for the users to type something for a shared memory connection. So we want to, if we see a lot of those, then that's fine. The server's spending most of its time waiting. Uh, what we don't want to see is waits for IOs. Uh, we don't want to see an IO wait uh, here in this column, okay, uh, or things like that. You know, our, we're running out of time, and we have a few questions, so be sure and All right, well, I'm, you know what, I'm pretty much wrapped up. The only other thing I wanted to show was the ONSTAT GPPF, and then we'll go on to questions. Okay, if you have partition um, profile turned on, then you want this will tell you your hit ratios by part, by part num. And what you want, you're looking for here is part numbers that have a low hit ratio. Obviously, this is a trivial amount of I.O. going on here. But you want to look for tables that have a low hit ratio. They're probably um, partitions that are being hit with a large number of sequential scans. Okay. Um, and that's pretty much the, the last thing I wanted to talk about today. So we have some questions? Yes, and um, the way we're going to do questions, uh, because if I unmute everybody, it will be chaos, uh, is if you can find the chat thing, uh, type a question in the chat uh, message, and I will relay it to Art. You can send it to me or send it to Art or send it to both of us. And uh, we have about three questions here from Ramon, which I'm going to take uh, first. Okay. And um, actually, if I, if I see you, and Ramon, I think I see you, I'm going to unmute you because You've got some complicated questions here, and then I'll let you ask Art directly. Okay, Ramon, you're unmuted. Can you uh, hear? Can you? Let's try hearing something from you. Oh, his mic is not working, so I'll read his message. His messages. Um, so the first question: His database has nine plus billion records. And uh, the, he ran the ratios uh, for 16K buffers, which is what he uses. Uh, the BR is 0%. BTR is 101.6%. UBTR per hour 
uh, is one minus one per hour, and the XDTR uh, is about three percent. Uh, the question is, should he reduce the number of buffers to four slide scans? He's mostly doing a data warehouse. What right. are your thoughts on that, Art? I would look at look at the um, look at the light scan output, the onset minus GLFC, I believe, um, and see how much you know what percentage of light scans are going on um, on the different partitions, um, and that will tell you whether or not you're, you're getting uh, enough light scans happening. Um, reducing buffers may help. You know, it may improve things. Light scans. The main thing about light scans is that they reduce the impact of heavy scanning on other queries. Um, so the query isn't loading data into the buffer that's never going to get used again. Um, if your cache is being used efficiently, then it does, Then light scans aren't going to give you a big imp improvement. Um, all right, if you have lots of processes doing complex queries and they're all looking at the same data, then having it in the cache is a good thing. Um, you know, if you're running queries that are all looking at different data um, so that they're chasing each other out of the cache, then the light scans are more efficient and you'll gain from them. Yeah, that, that's the key thing. I actually would wonder if you don't have enough memory and buffers in the first place. Uh, he, he said that he did the ONSTAT uh, and there were no light scans showing up. Um, okay. Um, I don't know what's going on there, and, and the BTR numbers don't sound right, so... Um, you know, I'd want to see the, the raw numbers. Um, if you want to send me an email, I'll look it over, Ramon. Um, send me the, the, you know, the ONSTAT uh, uh, G buff output and let me look at it and see what's going on and, the, and tell me the number of buffers you've got. Yeah, uh, Ramon, a very simple experiment with light scans is to set PDQ priority uh, equal one and just see if that will, will turn on light scans for one query. Uh, because oftentimes you may have something else that's preventing light scans from running. Um, but again, send, send Art the output. Uh, so the next question is uh, from Martin. I work primarily with IDS 11.5 and 11.7 on Windows. Are there any good admin tools written to run on Windows that aren't running services for Unix? Boy, that's yeah, a hard. The, I mean, you've got OAT and, and Server Studio. Those are the best tools for, for looking at the server um, beyond you know, the, just the OnStats. Um, you know, and obviously using OnStats on Windows is not fun. Um, so I would go with that. Um, if, you, if you're going to license Server Studio, and, and uh, I would go with Sentinel also, so you can do historical reporting um, and, and look at the, your performance over time uh, and graph it. Uh, some of that you can do in OAT also. Um, the only downside is that OAT stores its performance data in your server, which kind of affects the performance of the server, whereas uh, Server Studio keeps a separate repository. Um, which you can, can reconfigure. It has its own repository, or you can direct it at a, an Informix server that, that's off on the side somewhere. Cool. Martin says thank you. Any other questions? Let me go back through the list uh, here. Oh, another question was um, when you were talking about the uh, the um, read a, um, the ratios mm -hmm. back beginning for uh, buffer cleaning uh, for a data warehouse. Would you set them the same as for OLTP? Um, no, performance for a data warehouse is, is different, and you've got different concerns. So, um, you know, for example, write cache is not an issue uh, because most of your writes are. Uh, loading up new pages. Um, the BTR2 is going to become be more important than the BTR for a, a data warehouse, simply because you are you, you're doing lots of updates in batch mode, uh, and then no updates at all. Um, so it is different, um, but you but the, those BTR and BTR2 will still tell you how how 
um, how much you're beating up on your cash. And may, as Ramon is may be seeing, it may tell you that you, you're you're not getting light scans when you think you are. Um, so uh, it's those numbers are still important. Um, you're not going to see a high buff weights ratio on a on a data warehouse server. Uh, Ramon's is, is near zero. Um, because, of course, you only have a few users on the system, so you're not going to see contention for buffers. Things like that are different. Uh, read-ahead becomes more important on a data warehouse, um, but you still want to see that your read-ahead is being used efficiently. You'd be tuning it higher, but you still want to see a, a good utilization uh, number in the, in the high 90s. Next question is from Michael. Uh, how do you set the CPU VP cache? that you talked about, Art? Um, the parameter is VP memory cache. Is VP memory cache KB? And what's a good range for that? Um, it's going to so depend on, on your queries. What Basically what's going on here is there's a central pool of memory that the VPs share. That's, of course, your virtual segments, um, and when without this set and before it was possible to set it, basically each VP, when it needed memory, went to the central cache and had to latch it, uh, so it had exclusive access, and it would take a bunch of pages out of that cache uh, into its own user space to process a query, and, when that, and then release it, release the cache. Uh, when that query was done, it would put all those pages back into the, the central pool for other VPs to use. Um, but chances are the next query that came in would have it go back to the cache to get more. Um, so they came up with this idea of keeping some of that memory private in the VP. They call it private memory cache uh, in the VPs. Um, if that central pool gets depleted, then um, the central server, the central core of the server will make a request to the VPs to put, put some of their private memory back in the central pool. Um, for the busy queries, busy processors to use, which were the kind of the differences that we could see um, in that um, onset G VP cache output. All right, so it's hard to size it. I start with 4, 4K. Uh, in this case, I, I was set up to 10K, um, but as you saw, it's not using all of that 10K. Um, it's actually still using it, it's set, still using about 4K. Um, so that's a good, I've found that's a good place to start. It up and down from there. Cool. Um, one last question. Uh, what's your email address, Art? <laughs> so my email address is art.kegel at gmail.com. Um, okay, or you can send it to art at advanceddatatools.com. Uh, either one. And I will get it. And then, um, I, just as a reminder, we will have a replay of the uh, webcast. Uh, hopefully, the recording worked, um, and uh, it will be up on YouTube in about two days, um, and it will be on our website. So, if you go to advanceddatatools.com, the same place where you registered for this, uh, you'll see a note about the replay for this. Um, and our yes. Why don't you say a few things about the training? So we give a, what we call the Advanced Informix Performance Tuning course. Uh, the next class is in July on the 15th through the 18th, uh, and then again in October. Um, if we get anybody registered for the class, we will give it. We don't cancel classes that people are registered for, um, okay, just because we only have a couple of people registered. So if you sign up, you know you're going to get the course. Uh, yeah, I, I have actually taught a class with one student in it. Now, okay. the last uh, class we did, we actually uh, overfilled, and okay. we had to turn people away at the last minute. So, so don't wait for the last minute. Um, you can take the course in-house at our training center in Annandale, Virginia, or you can subscribe, and we can do it over WebEx the way we're doing, kind of doing it today. Um, everybody gets their own private server, uh, which is a four-core Linux box, and uh, with a, and we run basically we run through different database. Um, scenarios, both data warehouse loading and high-performance OLTP, um, and we actually tune the servers live 
uh, and you'll see how much things can improve. Um, you'll see performance going from 40 minutes to complete a task down to less than two minutes to complete a task, um, and you'll learn how to get that tuning done okay, and how to recognize what to do next. All right. So that's it. We are advanced data tools. Over here we've, in the corner, we've got a little hint about, uh, about the next release of Informix, which is coming up soon. And uh, there's my email address for if you didn't catch it, or one of them anyway. All right. And I'll assume, because you're here, that you found our website. So 